Good day and welcome. I'm Professor Faith Ruffin uh, and I'm with the uh, Discipline of Public Governance in the School of Management, IT and Governance here at the College of Law and Management Studies at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. So the purpose of today is to talk about mastering the master of public administration module called research methodology and applied techniques. Now uh, for the MPA program, uh, as you know, you take uh, three coursework modules the first semester, three coursework modules the second semester, and provided that you pass all of those, which I'm sure each and every one of you will, uh, the following year of this two-year program, you work on your dissertation. But as far as I'm concerned, with the research methodology and applied techniques module, you're starting on your dissertation now. By that I mean the purpose or one of the main purposes of this module is for you to leave this module with a research proposal, with data collection tools, with consent forms if you're going to conduct an empirical study, and with a completed ethical clearance application. In other words, if you follow the instructions that are in the syllabus, and if you pay attention to all the assessments, including the work that must be done on Moodle, uh, including the attendance in class, the team building uh, experiences and team learning experiences that you have with your colleagues, uh, if you make a friend out of turn it in and submit all your work on time, you can definitely be supervisor ready when you leave this module. So let's project that as a goal. Now, when I say that, this doesn't mean that uh, whatever research problem you decide on for this research is going to be the same research problem that you handle for your dissertation. But the idea is for you to learn and understand how to identify and articulate a research problem and how to work out all the various components that are involved in a, a research uh, proposal. So uh, when you think about a research proposal, for this module, we're talking about the application of scientific research, which can be empirical or non-empirical. However, it's important to understand that until you handle um, that larger crank in that series of wheels identifying the research problem, you're not going anywhere. The research problem is the heart of the research proposal. Now I have people come to me and they'll tell me, oh no, Prof, I already know my topic. Oh, this is my topic. And uh, my topic is gonna be on this and that. I don't wanna hear about your topic. This is not about topics. This is not a research paper. This is not uh, a high school research paper or a undergraduate research paper. This is scientific research where you are required to apply scientific techniques, irrespective of whether the study is empirical or non-empirical. Non so that means that, and you'll ask me, how do, you, how do you find a research problem? Well, there are a lot of different ways to find a research problem, and we're gonna talk about that a little further in a few minutes. But the point I wanna make with these turning wheels here that you see in front of you on this PowerPoint, uh, you see, identifying the research problem is number one. And then once you get up into the research proposal and the data collection tools, both of those signal back to the big item, the larger circle in the crank of wheels, which is identifying the problem. So in other words, the, the research problem has to be identifiable in the way you write the research proposal. We're gonna talk about all the different uh, 
uh, phases uh, of a research proposal. We're going to talk about the format of a research proposal. We're going to talk about how you're going to be evaluated on your research proposal. But that research problem must come through in your decision about research questions or research objectives or your decision about a hypothesis. It must come through in your decision about a research design or a research strategy. It must be evident in the data collection tools. These still have to connect with the research problem. The philosophical worldview or the underlying um, uh, philosophy that you attach has to be compatible to the research problem. Even after we pass the data collection tools and go into data analysis, the data analysis has to be appropriate for the type of research problem that you've identified. In addition to that, when you move forward to come up with what uh, the outcomes are or what the findings are, the conclusions, the recommendations, those must show that you have addressed the research problem. So now I hope you're starting to get the gist of the paramount importance of a research problem. If you don't have a research problem, things are not going to go well at all because the various components will not talk to each other. Even when you come up with the types of theories that you use or the types of concepts, the theoretical framework, uh, or the conceptual framework that you use to guide the study, it must talk to the research problem. So look at the research problem as your main focus. And hopefully um, over this past few weeks since the classes have started, you've been busy with all of this since uh, in just a few days from the date that I'm recording this you will be presenting your group research proposals. And then shortly after that, you'll be presenting and submitting your individual research proposals. So you might uh, think about, well, aren't we going to see slides where you give us the definitions and tell us what this means and what that means? No, I'm not. No, that's not going to happen. Master of Public Administration. And as I've said in class many times before, this is NQF level nine. <laughs> the step before NQF level 10, which is a PhD, as high as one can go in the various academic qualifications. So if you think that I'm gonna spend the little class time that we have together doing the block release sessions, talking about defining a research design and defining a research strategy and defining data, now, it's not going to happen. Who is supposed to find out? You are. This is why you have the Cresswell textbook. This is why you have the Yin textbook. This is why you're expected to discover journal articles on your own. There is no phone speeding. Spoon, what is that? Spoon feeding. You see, I can't even say it right because I believe so little in it. There will be no spoon feeding in this module. I'm expecting you to know these things through self-learning, through self-empowerment. Because as I explained in the syllabus, we're working here from a teaching philosophy of emancipatory education. And emancipatory education means that uh, the whole idea is for me as a facilitator to help liberate you intellectually, you know, intellectual liberation. You know, you heard of spiritual liberation, although we might do a little bit of that too. You've heard about uh, physical liberation, you know, like overcoming things like colonization, slavery, apartheid, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, so here, we want to liberate your intellect so that you start thinking differently, so that you critically analyze every 
aspect of that which may come forward, we expect for you to be able to experience deep learning, not surface learning. If you don't know what those things are, you need to look them up. Because if you're gonna try to get by in here with surface learning, you're gonna fail. You'll be back next year, I can guarantee you that. Since I'm not going to be giving you tests, and I'm gonna talk about the final exam in, in a minute before we go to the next slide, there's not gonna be a test that asks you for definitions or true and false or mix and match or even short answers. There's not gonna, the test is not gonna be that way. I will actually hold a class session on how to take the test because the test is about application. Every single thing in this module revolves around application. And the only way that you can apply the various components of research methodology is to learn it and to know it, to make it a part of your spirit. I can see you at pick and pay and ask you a research methodology question and you can answer it on the spot because there's so much in you and it must be in you in order for you to complete the dissertation. You can't think about this program as this is coursework and next year's dissertation. The dissertation is now. You have to understand how it works. And most importantly, develop a community of practice among yourself. So now it might not seem like it, but when you're in these groups and you know, group learning works a lot, especially in terms of indigenous ways of knowing, collaborative learning, African ways of knowing, collaboration, communalism, all those things are key. Yeah, you have each other right now. But this time next year, when you're working on that dissertation, you're on your own. But you don't have to be on your own. Get to know each other. Build relationships with each other so that you become a community of practice and support each other and remember the things that we have experienced uh, in this semester. So uh, as it indicates uh, in the syllabus, there will be two tests, but those tests, I will give you a case scenario. This is why we're gonna practice how to take a test. And you should take the test, I'm gonna put it on Moodle. You should take the test before you come to the session when we're gonna review it. And remember, the test is March 14th, so all this stuff is happening very quickly. Uh, so now, you want to look at the case scenario, read all of it, and then there will be questions after it. And you'll see in the various sections how many points each set of questions is worth. But those questions are going to basically ask you to write a research proposal. Everything in this module is about research proposal. There'll be questions, for example, that the case scenarios change, but the questions are pretty much the same because no, it's not open book. And you will have to say, given this uh, case scenario, articulate the research problem. So you've got to look at what I've written for you and then get a research problem out of that. Then another question might say, uh, identify uh, four research questions and objectives that flow from this research problem. And then another section might ask you about data analysis or ask you about uh, you know, the, uh, a case study or what strategy are you using, why did you use that strategy. But just so you remember, when you're answering these questions on this test, uh, stay with me because now you know I jump around. You've been in class with me. You know how that works. That's why I wanted to record this for you because I know you usually try to tape so you can keep up. So now, when you are answering those questions, don't give me bullets. Don't start defining research design and leave it. Don't drop it and leave it. But you do want to tell me at least three different types of research design and then you do want to pick one for that research problem that you've identified in an earlier question. And then you wanna go ahead and justify it and then apply it in terms of how you would do it when you undertake the research. So in other words, the test, I'm expecting responses that are in narrative form and not in bullet form and not just defining elements. You have to define elements in order for you to be able to apply. Your marks are coming from application. And another reason that we need to focus 
on. This whole research problem and the whole research proposal scenario is because even your final exam is a research proposal, your individual research proposal. So your group research proposal is what you will be presenting the first week in March. And then your individual proposal is what you would be uh, presenting the week of 20th of April, in April. But you need to be working on your individual research proposal now. And you'll notice on Moodle that uh, it's covering or asking you to respond in accordance to your individual research proposal. So if you're thinking that, okay, you focus on your group research proposal, and after you sort all that out, then you go back and do the individual research proposal, no, you're not going to have time. You have to work on these things simultaneously, and you can do that. Why? Because you are about to be a master of public administration, and you're at, what is it, in QF level 9. So you have to be able to do these things. Uh, and it's better when you consult with each other. So the point I'm making is Moodle's asking you a bunch of questions that uh, will allow you to bring out your research proposal. And you're doing that at the same time that you're working on your team learning proposal with your group. So that's what I mean about these things are happening simultaneously. So that test, um, I'm sorry, the exam, the final exam, uh, you will be submitting that individual research proposal, but that's going to be about the third rendition of your proposal. Just to recapitulate what I said um, when the classes first begin regarding your individual research proposal. The first bite at the apple is when in April you present your research proposal to all of us. And we critique it, we provide you with feedback, you get somebody to take notes for you, and I'll tell you everything I have to say about your presentation. On that same day, you will also give me a hard copy, just as when we have the presentations for the group research proposals, you give a hard copy in, in addition to your PowerPoint. So focusing on the individual presentation. You're gonna give me that hard copy that day, and I'm going to be marking that while you're talking, and I'm going to give you notes, and you'll find one of your classmates to take notes for you. Don't try to take notes when I'm giving you feedback. That's not going to work. You'll find out that when I'm in the moment and I'm in your particular proposal, I'm going to be saying a lot of different things, and you can't listen and write at the same time when I'm saying whatever's coming to me. So you'll find somebody to take notes or maybe even more than one somebody to take notes for you. So that's the first bite at the apple when you make that proposal presentation in April. Then sometime during the last two weeks in April uh, or the first week in May, somewhere in there, I schedule small group sessions for students. So this may be a group of three or four students. We'll meet during the week. I'll set aside some time, maybe three or four hours. All of you will be expected to take leave from work and come. If you need a letter, we'll give you a letter. You don't want to miss this session. When you come with that session, I will then sit there and listen to each one of your uh, comments on my comments, because you won't be making a presentation when you come back. By then, you should have incorporated the feedback that I gave you the first go round. When we have that sit down with the small groups, I'll be going back and forth between the syllabus, the criteria, which you have already, uh, and the criteria for the proposal is going to be in this PowerPoint coming up, but just so you start to live by it, it's on pages 9 and 10. Then I'm going to be looking at the research diagram, which I've handed out to everybody, but we're going to talk about it today as well. And then I'm going to be going by the research proposal format, another document that you already have that tells you all the sections for the research proposal. So I'm going to be looking at those three documents interchangeably during this small group 
session or a workshop, if you will. And guess what? I'm going to pull your proposal on the screen. And we're going to be going through it line by line, page by page for all of those who are in that group. Again, you need to take notes for each other. And if I cover something in someone's proposal and then I get to your proposal and you have the same problem that that other person had, because you know what problems you have. When I start talking and identifying issues, you'll know whether you have those same issues. You need to take notes on that because I'm not going to repeat the remedy for whatever issue that I identified in somebody else's proposal. So the whole idea is for you each to hear feedback that I'm giving to each other. So then you can also support each other. This is another part of the philosophy in the module in terms of the team-based learning. So you can call your colleague and say, what was Prof saying? What, do you remember what she was talking about when she said thus and so? So this is how you want to get to support each other. So those small group sessions, and by the way, after those sessions, uh, I will send you a written document after I've had all the meetings with you and point out some common errors, some common issues, and uh, some common uh, feed forward that I've given over all the different groups. So that's the second bite of the apple. Now, the third bite of the apple is your final exam, which is a take home. So by that I mean that we'll set the date in May where all the individual research proposals are due. And this will be your final exam. So I hope by now you're really starting to see the importance of the research problem and the research proposal. Now I will have vetted that research proposal for you during the first rendition when you give your individual research proposals, uh, presentations. I will have done it again that second go round when I have the small group learning about the review of the research proposals. And then the third time I'll see it is when you submit it as a final exam. There's no way in the world where you should be doing poorly on that final exam. There's no way. If you've kept up because the volume of work is high and you do have to keep up. But now there are items that need to be attached to that proposal that I will not be reviewing in advance. And that would be your data collection tools, your ethical clearance form, and the proper consent forms to match your data collection tools. I'm not going to tell you where those are. Uh, this is the university that has the research office. You need to be able to figure those things out and find out for yourself how to do these things on your own. All right, so I just wanted to cover all those things. So you start to see how important it is to grapple with this research problem and to move forward with the uh, research proposal. So now, let's talk a little bit about uh, identifying the research problem. It's not really as easy as it sounds. I think one of the reasons that people always come and say, okay, here's my topic, because it's easy to come up with a topic. You just think in your mind and then you say whatever it is. You look at what's happening at your place of employment and that somebody did you wrong and you want to conduct research about that to prove how bad they were to you. You know, I've had that. Students try to do that. You can tell they got a vendetta against somebody and that's why they want to have that topic. No, this is not what scientific research is all about. What scientific research is about is addressing issues in the South African context, in the static context, in the African continental context, in the global South context, and globally, period. So we're working on all these different governance scales. We don't want you to take on this myopic thing and that we're only going to be looking at research in terms of what is happening in South Africa. No, we don't live in a vacuum in South Africa. Yeah, we're a sovereign state, but we're also part of a regional collective 
static. We're also a part of the African continent, the AU. And we're also involved in BRICS and various, various Global South arrangements with different countries. So you got to think big. And when you're thinking about this research problem, as you'll see in the um, uh, MPA proposal format, that we talk out, start out with a broader research problem, and then we move it down into a narrow research problem. So finding the research problem, let's start in the middle with the literature review. Now, the literature review, you, you just got to come to grips with the literature review. Nothing's going to happen without the literature review. And it's not just going to be a literature review that gives you the research problem. When you write your dissertation, the literature review that's often chapter two that gives context and theories and, and concepts and substance to your research, that's not the only literature review. Chapter three of your dissertation on research methodology is another literature review. You're not gonna make it without reading. This is why we had that uh, session, and then, uh, and then I went through those PowerPoints with you and distributed them on critical reading strategies. This is why your first assignment was critiquing journal articles and then seeing how to even evaluate your own critique. You have to be able to evaluate your own work. But in addition to that, you have to be able to critically analyze the work of scholars. And there's a process and procedure for that. It's not just sitting there reading through it and then not understanding and not comprehending and reading it over and over again and still not, no, you have to go into these journal articles on a mission. You have to be in discovery mode. You have to be in investigative mode. And this is why by learning how to critique journal articles, you are set up with how to conduct a literature review. Now, when you're discussing this, uh, or reviewing the literature, and you start writing about what is there, you'll find some journal articles that identify certain gaps in the literature. They might say scholar ABC studied this, uh, scholar DEF studied that, but nobody has studied such and such and such a thing. Hey, that's an inroad. Maybe that's something that you want to take up. Or you might see that uh, uh, scholars have studied a particular issue, but they use one type of methodology, and then you want to maybe look at it from a different type of methodology. So the literature review is first and foremost getting you familiar with what is the state of the knowledge, what is the scholarly knowledge. And you want to be critical of scholars and, and start to see where they're coming from, what are their philosophical worldviews. Uh, as we discussed in the, when we went over critical reading strategies, um, is there some type of uh, bias going on? Are they trying to convince you of some proposition? Uh, and also, uh, are they aligning the various components of their research with one another? Is the research problem identified? Uh, do the data collection tools and the research questions and objectives, do they match the research problem? Do they tell you what the philosophical worldview is? So the reason that we started out with learning how to critique these journal articles is because basically that's the story of your life between now and you complete this degree with a satisfactory dissertation. Even when you get into chapter four of your dissertation, you find uh, I'm gonna talk sometime about your proposal and also about your dissertation to get you used to the idea that this is a reality. You know, don't think you're just taking classes now. It's deeper than that. So now in chapter four, which is generally where uh, one would um, present the findings and analyze and interpret the data, again, when you're interpreting that data, you have to go 
back to the literature reveal that you've constructed and find out how your findings stack up against the findings of the studies that came out in your literature review. This is for non-empirical and empirical studies. And, and we're happy for you to choose whether you want to conduct a desktop study or whether you want to conduct an empirical study. They both uh, are scientifically uh, available and they both require a lot of work and they both have their own particular structures. You know, sometimes when people think about a desktop study, they think, oh, maybe, maybe it's just like a research paper. No, it's not. I had one student that was working on a, um, a non-empirical study, and uh, he indicates in, uh, in the research methodology section that since uh, it's non-empirical, there's no sampling. Really? Of course there's sampling. <laughs> you can't conduct research without a sample of whatever categories or whatever uh, topics or situations that you're studying. So even in non-empirical research, there is uh, sampling, data collection. There is data collection there. When you get ready to go and look for uh, research uh, journal articles and, and books, uh, policies and things of that nature, you have to use keywords and phrases as a strategy for data collection. You have to come up with what uh, would be the uh, search engines, EBSCOhost or uh, Academic Premier, all these different, these are all tools for data collection. So please, you, you can definitely decide to do a desktop study, which means you don't have any involvement with humans participating, which that alone has its uh, you know, attractions. Um, just know it's not a walk in the park and it has its own particular structure. There's another student um, who really struggled with a research uh, proposal for the um, non-empirical or desktop study. And we're talking more than a year. I was not satisfied with the, uh, with the proposal because the proposal was not setting out what needed to happen because this uh, another student also thought that it's just a, a research paper with a bunch of documentary evidence. No, it's also a scientific document. And often uh, when I'm supervising, I have the students for non-empirical or empirical uh, research to write that chapter two and chapter three, even before we go with the proposal so that I know that they have some ground to stand on. So. The literature review, as I'm saying, is, is like the hallmark of your life. And this is where you, one of the places that you'll find the research problem. Uh, the scholars may or may not point it out as a research problem. But if you pull in different journal articles about certain topics or certain research areas, then you'll start to see who has studied what and what remains unstudied. We don't want to just keep reinventing the wheel and studying the same things that have been studied over and over and over. Uh, I think we can all agree in South Africa and the work that we want to do in uh, changing the face of the public sector and public service delivery is we have enough unresolved problems to find a unique area and to capture a problem that's going to address some of these issues that we're dealing with. So that's one example. And the literature review, again, can include your journal articles, your books, your policy documents. Websites, mm, it depends. Some websites are, are better than others. So uh, you need to be careful about what you pull from a website. And also, Turnitin is not a big fan of websites. So um, you're going to have the session on training on turn it in soon and, and you'll see, you can ask questions about that. So now uh, media accounts, what does that mean? Well, we always have things in the media. So that even could be an inroad that gives you an idea. For example, I had a student who decided that she wanted to research the issue with uh, fires in uh, informal uh, settlements, uh, you know, the we always have something in the news about all these shacks going up 
in flames and people lose their uh, uh, all their documents, you know, their ID, you know, their their furniture, their all their everything connected with their livelihood through these fires. And you know, the question becomes, what can be done to prevent that, and what's happening to prevent that, and how is the municipality not allowing that to happen? So uh, she had a lot of fodder from newspaper articles. Newspaper articles can help you, but they can't be the only thing. Because even though she found that that's an issue in the country, fires and informal settlements, then she had to go and conduct research on the whole institution, and it's really an institution now, of the whole informal settlements or human settlement uh, scholarly work on that from a theoretical and a practical uh, standpoint. So she had, they had to send her to the literature to come up with what would be the um, conceptual framework to study such a problem, or what would be the theoretical framework for this. You can also turn to statistics. You know, we have Statistics South Africa that gives us uh, a lot of information on uh, what's going on in the state of the nation. Also, various government offices uh, document and keep statistics that can be very telling and give us information on how to articulate a research problem. So the, as I said, and I'll be saying for a while until I feel like you got it, is that the research problem is the heart of the dissertation. And, and I'll know if you got it when I start asking you questions, okay? So now let's uh, look at more of an overview in terms of writing a research proposal. By the way, uh, when you're watching this, it's important to have those three documents with you, the syllabus, the research diagram, and also the NPA proposal format. Have those in front of you because I'm going to be referring to them. And also have in front of you the Cresswell book and the Ying book. So I know people are often not happy to purchase books. And I've heard the stories where I paid all that money for the book and they didn't even use it in class. Well, that's not this class. We're going to be living by those books. You will find the Moodle exercises. Some of the questions that we're going to be posting and some of the issues that we're going to be discussing come at the end of the chapters in Cresswell and Ying, which means you have to have read the chapter in order to be able to answer those questions on Moodle. And don't forget, don't take Moodle lightly. That's 15% of your mark. That can bring you up or that can take you down. So be sure that you get the books. And the, the best ones to get will be, excuse me, of course, the ones that, that are the most recent. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. But you should have those two books with you and these three documents when you're going through these, uh, through this presentation. Uh, I'm hearing a question being posed about the test. Is it open book? No, it's not open book. The test is not open book. Mm -mm. See, I saw you were thinking that. No, it's not going to happen. You got to get these things in your spirit. You got to be able to look at a case scenario and unpack what would be the research problem like you see in this uh, slide. What would be the research objectives? What would be the research questions? How do they, those two talk to each other? Do you have the need for a hypothesis? And Cresswell unpacks very nicely different types of hypotheses. Besides the null hypothesis and the uh, alternate hypothesis, there's all different kinds of hypotheses, and you need to know which one is the best for addressing your research problem. The rationale and motivation, you have to be able to state that. You're going to state it in your group research proposal. You're going to state it in your individual research proposal. And if the question is there, you'll state it on one of the two tests. So you're not going to get around being able to apply the techniques 
that you're going to be learning. And we'll go over that when we're looking at the research diagram. You're going to have to learn, live, and breathe. Maybe put that research diagram on your refrigerator or put it somewhere on a mirror. Because, you know, uh, MPA study or any postgrad study, especially master's and PhD, it's not just the individual studying, okay? The whole family's involved in this. Because now you're not going to be able to be with your family the way you normally are with your family. And I'm sure you found that out already. And we talked about that the first day of class. All that socializing and all those different events, you're not going to make all the events. So the safest thing to do, as I mentioned before, is just clarify that with your family because they too are making the investment in this. And your biggest investment here is your time. If you're not going to invest your time in this module, you're not going to pass. But guess what? Before the deadline for withdrawal, if it looks like you're not going to pass, I'm going to ask you to withdraw from the module. You know why? Because I don't need lazy students pulling down my pass rate. Okay? No, I'm not going there. So if you're having a problem, if it's something that you don't understand, everybody knows I'm available. Email, WhatsApp, telephone. You, know, you can't say you couldn't reach me. But I do have what I told you before, the two before rule. If you have a question of me, something you don't understand, go ask two of your classmates before you come to me. Then you come to me, you can make an appointment. I can see you one-on-one -on -one in my office. We can use Skype. We can use WhatsApp video chat. We can talk or communicate any way you want to communicate. But I want to hear what those other two classmates said because that's how I gauge whether or not they're getting what I'm saying. Because if you're not getting it, then I gotta find another way to say it. As we discussed when we went over the syllabus, and you really need to get deep in that syllabus, there's a lot there. I mean, you'll find, you might even kick yourself because I have things on the syllabus that actually were part of the test, but people never read the syllabus, so they missed the question on the test. But, um, you know, so you take the time to read that syllabus more than once. So the point I'm making, though, is that uh, uh, once you uh, uh, come back to me, I want to hear what the other people have said. And then, uh, you know, because like it is in the syllabus, there's a section in there that talks about, uh, Okay, let me just point it out now, because we went over this in class, but I don't know. Uh, everything was new then, and I know you were taking in the gravity of the module, so you might not have been listening. But on page three are the teaching and learning objectives, the objectives of this module. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get across to you. And then on page four are the learning outcomes, and this is what... Uh, I'm expecting you to show me. So look at the syllabus like a contract, okay? The teaching and learning objectives, the teaching and learning outcomes. I'm supposed to do my part, you're supposed to do your part. So in so doing, I need to know these things I have in the objectives, you come to me and I do this, you'll find we'll do this the next time we get together, I'll ask you, uh, look at the objectives in the syllabus. Okay, which ones am I meeting? Which ones am I not? I'm asking you, tell me. Because I'm sure going to ask you about the learning outcomes, and I'm definitely going to interrogate which ones you exhibited and which one you're not. So I want to bring these objectives, and I need you to bring those outcomes so that we meet in this contractual situation called your learning experience, which is very independent oriented and, and in, interrogative. So um, I'm saying that to say, uh, you come to me, you tell me what the other two people said, and then I'll give you whatever the answer is. But then I'm going to find another way to convey whatever that was to make sure everybody gets it. Okay, there's no such thing as a stupid question, no such thing as a dumb question. The only stupid or idiotic question is the one that you feel it in your heart and you never ask. That's a problem. So uh, 
Moving on now, the, you see the research methodology section, and then it goes back to the research problem. So now the research problem started this out for the simple reason that it must be, uh, that all the other uh, parts that are going around it must be aligned to the research problem. So now let's just look at uh, a little bit about the evaluation criteria. And as you're going through this uh, presentation that I'm making, please jot down any questions and, and bring them out so we can resolve them. So now, what are the, these are the three documents that I asked you to pull out. The syllabus, okay, the syllabus is, what is it? Uh, 11 pages, not bad, okay. All your evaluation criteria are listed here for all the assessments. This is not a situation where, you know, you have to guess about how you're going to be marked. Uh, in addition to that, we have the research diagram, which is here. And we're going to go over a little bit more. And then, of course, we have the research proposal format, which gives you every single heading for your proposal. So when I go through your proposals, whether it's a group proposal or the individual proposal, I'm ticking. Are you going to give me something that has no subheading that says research questions or objectives? I mean, maybe you don't have questions. Maybe you just have objectives and hypotheses, but you have to have something there. You're definitely not going to give me a research proposal where you don't have a heading about a literature review or that you're going to give me a, one that doesn't have a conceptual or a theoretical framework. So I'm ticking from here. I'm ticking from the research diagram, and I'm definitely ticking from the syllabus. So now I want to talk a little bit about the criteria that are in the syllabus. It's important to know what your uh, expectations are. I'm sure at um, your places of employment, you have some form of uh, performance management. And when the person is uh, experiencing performance management, they want to know the criteria, right? You want to know, okay, how, what are you basing your judgment on? Uh, how are you determining? Well, how, what my evaluation is going to look like. Well, this syllabus provides this for you. Criteria for research proposals. And that is on, uh, in case you're having trouble finding it. I think I said it earlier. But it's on, uh, I think it's page 9. Yeah, page 9 and 10. So now let's just unpack these a, a little bit because this is what I will be looking for when you make your group presentations and when you make your individual uh, proposal presentations. Are you paying attention to following the research proposal format? The same research proposal format that I just referred to. Are you coming up with innovative ideas for pragmatic approaches to research problems and designs. So in other words, I don't need you to tell me something that everybody has said for decades. I need for you to start being innovative and looking at things from a different way. Use a critical eye. Use some interesting uh, philosophical worldviews like critical theory, uh, you know, or transformation, or interpretivism. Uh, something that has a kick to it, so to speak, that will make you delve deeper into whatever the research problem may be. Now, that's a big chunk of a mark, 20%, for how well you do that. Then number two, do the research problem and research question, or that could be research objectives, that could be hypothesis, logically flow from the literature review? This is the alignment that I'm talking about back here. You see that alignment and uh, when it's dealing with the research problem, this is the same thing that I'm talking about in number two here. So can I look at your literature review and see what scholars you use to write up your research problem? Yes, your research problem must have scholarly treatment. You can't write a research problem just off the top of your head. It has to be based on literature. So actually, 
you have to do the literature review, look at those media accounts, look at the, excuse me, statistics, and work all that out before you can even come up with a research problem, which is why you have learned how to critique journal articles. Number three, does the research design clearly match the research problem? So now you can give me a research problem that asks things like what and, and uh, how many, and then give me uh, a research design that's quantitative uh, only, uh, but then you have that how question sitting there, and you have that what question sitting there, and the how question is about how many, which already you're talking about numbers. So within the research question and the research problem, it's going to guide you to what type of research design. You don't pick a research design because you like it or it feels good or you think it's easy. No. The research design must flow directly from the research problem and in the middle of those two or that intervention is the research question or the research questions and objectives or the hypothesis. Again, the study will tell you whether or not you need to go for a hypothesis. So what I, I really want you to try to get from all this is that you can't make this stuff up, stuff up as you go along. And all your marks that you're going to be getting for this module, you're going to be marked on the same thing over and over again. I'm just using different strategies to show it to you. So once you have learned the various definitions, once you have learned the applications from reading the books, from reading the journal articles, you'll demonstrate to, that to me as a learning outcome. I'll tell by the way you articulate it during your presentation. I'll tell by how you handle the interrogation. Yeah, I am going to interrogate you. And I'm sure you've heard about that before. I'm going to see how you respond to that interrogation during the presentations, and I'm going to see what's in your written document. And using those three documents that I keep telling you about, I'm going to be doing all my ticking and going back and forth about whether or not your research question and research problem are connected to that literature review, 15%. Does the research design clearly match the research problem? Now, yeah, that's a lot of points for that, 20%. Well, why is that? It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy to come up with a bona fide research problem based on a gap in the literature that you have to search out, that you have to indicate what's your rationale, motivation, or even what is the significance of you studying, whatever that is, and you have to identify uh, who's done what and what's missing before you can come up with a research problem and then you need a research design to match it. So yeah, you have to define what are different types of research designs and we'll discuss the fact that uh, uh, um, a structure or a component may have different names because we might call a research design uh, qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods but somebody else might call a research design exploratory, um, uh, explanatory, or descriptive. You see, so a research design has multiple definitions, but that's a great thing. You know what makes that so great? The fact that as a research scholar yourself, you have to compare and contrast what other scholars are saying. So for the mere definition of the research design, you're going to have a field day because you can say so-and-so scholars defines research design as this. So-and-so, in contrast, this one says it's that. And still another one says it's so-and-so. But for the purposes of this study, it is thus and this and whatever it is or the definition that you're using. By the way, for this module, we're defining research designs as qualitative, quantitative, and uh, mixed methods. Now, <clears throat> there's not a lot of absolutes in research. And even calling research designs either qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods definitely not an absolute. But the reason I'm doing this for this module is, and I'll tell you about things that fall into this category, that's because we have to have a benchmark 
of how your mark is going to be determined. So if you tell me that the research design is exploratory, descriptive, explanatory, you're not going to get, I might give you a half a point, but you're not going to get real points for that because we have to go by what the definitions are, but you need to be able to explain those things. Are the research strategies in alignment with the research questions? Again, these things are very important because the research strategy has to be able to handle or to undertake or to execute what the research questions are trying to find out. So now let's just look at those things right there. Now you see where I have research questions. Just as in number two, that could have been research question, research objectives, hypothesis. It's the same thing in number four. All right, so even though it says our research strategy is in alignment with the research questions, I'm also looking at whether it's in alignment with the research objectives and the um, hypothesis, if you have a hypothesis. So now, why are research questions important? Well, there are several reasons for that. One is that the research question is helping you delimit your study, delimit the focus of your study. The research question is also providing a guide in terms of what you are trying to figure out. But what you don't want to do is get a research question confused with an interview question. And I've seen that too often. Now, when you're doing your work, things are going to come to you. Remember, you're training your mind. You know, we don't use all of our brain. That's one of the challenges with human beings that uh, we don't use all our brain cells. We don't exercise our brain the way we could. You're exercising your brain in this module. You're going to be using cells you haven't used before, brain cells. I've had people come to me and tell me they got a headache because their brain is being overworked. Your brain is not being overworked. Your brain is being exercised. This is why you have a brain. <laughs> so uh, the research questions have to be formulated in a way that embraces the research problem, that embraces the research design, that embraces the research strategies. All of these items, all of these components have to be aligned. And this is what you're getting marked on. You're getting marked on alignment and application. You're not getting marked on definitions per se, but you got to get give the definitions before you can apply. And in addition to that, uh, you need the definitions to explain what it is that you're trying to the point that you're trying to make. So the research design must be a design that suitably addresses the research problem. Hey, how will you know that? You will know that, no, I'm not reading your mind, but hey, I don't know, maybe I am. Uh, does the research design clearly match the research problem? When you're studying research designs and what the different uh, designs are, you will find out that they have different uh, components. They, they are unpacked differently. They have different purposes. Uh, their objectives are different their uh, outcomes and their strategies are different. So you don't go about conducting uh, qualitative research the same way you conduct quantitative research. Now, in mixed methods research, yeah, you're going to mix a bit of qualitative, a bit of quantitative, but one is usually more dominant than the other. And you're going to have different strategies that go along with that mixed methods. But there are certain strategies that go along with uh, qualitative designs, and there are certain strategies that go along with quantitative designs, as we're going to discuss in the research diagram. But right here on number three, the point is that you got to let your research problem talk to you. Your work has to talk to you. It's not just you talking to your work. You're going to find yourself talking out loud. It's fine. 
because the research is trying to talk to you. It has its own message. The research takes on its own life. It has its own state of being outside of you, outside of me. You know, there's a problem here trying to be solved. That problem can talk for itself. But you just have to know how to interpret it and you have to develop the audible capacity to hear it, to listen, to feel it, to sense it, to unpack it. So that research problem is going to tell you, hey, no, 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 take me qualitative because of this, 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 and that. Or that research problem may tell you, hey, I need a little bit, if you really want to get at me, if you really want to address me, this is a research problem I'm talking, then I'm going to need a little bit of qualitative over here and a little bit of quantitative. Can you hook me up? You know? So you got to hear what the research problem is saying to you in order to come up with what the research design is going to be. Number four, are the research strategies in align with the research questions? Now, first of all, with the terminology, research strategies, called different things by different scholars in different camps, which is great for you as a research scholar. So you have to know that there's a group of people out there that say a case study is a research design, and you have another people out there that says a case study is a research strategy. You have a group of people out there that say the interpretivism paradigm is a research strategy where you have those, another group of people saying it's really a philosophical worldview. So this is what I mean by, you know, you got to read to be clued up on these things. And as you, I'm sure, are beginning to tell, it's not that it's a right or wrong answer, but there are some that are more right than others. What brings the correctness to the picture is the alignment of the different components of the research proposal. And unless those components are aligned, you're going to have problems later on down the line. All right, are the research strategies in alignment with the research questions and or the research objectives uh, and or the hypothesis, whatever the case might be? And again, your study will tell you if you need to have a hypothesis. Now look at this last one. 25%. Oh, this must be really important to Prof Ruffin for her to assign a percentage of 25%. Now, let me just try to tell you that story right quick. Your overall academic writing, that's number one you're going to have to take up academic writing. It's a doctrine, it's a journey in and of itself. It's a different type of writing. And I give you cues. I always tell people, go to the University of Toronto website. They have a brilliant section on academic writing. They give you examples about common grammatical errors. They tell you about how you can't, or you're not supposed to, because you can, but you're not supposed to academically, end a sentence with a preposition. Or they'll tell you when to use the word on, or when to use of, or when to use with. They will help you identify that you're a person who writes run-on sentences. A good sentence in, in lexicon terms is about 25 words. Hey, I've seen read uh, uh, proposals and dissertations of 59 words in a sentence, you know, because they were writing like they were talking. No. In academic writing, yes, write it all out. Write it all out. Get it out. But once you get it out, edit your own work. You have to go back and look at your work and check these things and find out what your common errors are. Look at commonalities or dissimilarities between E.C. Zulu and English. And then it'll be easy to identify if you're used to saying something in the way it would be in E.C. Zulu. Maybe that's not the way the sentence is structured. In fact, we know that's not the way a sentence is structured in English. Just identify those things. And then after you've done all your work, go back and fix it. You know, the university is really not keen on students having to get their work edited because the general feel is, as a postgraduate student, especially at the master's or doctoral level, you should be able to 
perform academic writing of a high caliber. Above all, you don't want to get me riled up, and I'm sure you've heard about that too, uh, because I'm pulling your proposal on the screen and I'm pulling, seeing a lot of red lines and blue lines. Now students are getting clever. They're trying to fix their uh, documents so that the blue lines and red lines don't come up, but they really sink in themselves because the blue lines and the red lines, the, the red lines are telling you something is misspelled. The blue lines are telling you you have a grammatical error. If you click on, if you right click on that red line, it's going to give you options for how to correctly spell the word. My goodness, learn from the corrected spelling. Correct your spelling. I'm not the spelling corrector here. You see a blue line coming up half a sentence. Right click on that blue line. And it's going to give you options on how to restate. Academic writing is better to write in the active voice instead of the passive voice. A lot of times we talk and write in the passive voice. So we need to learn what is the active voice and fix it. So that's just that first arm of that statement, the academic writing in and of itself. Analytical ability. Okay, if you're just going to repeat something that some scholar said somewhere without breaking it down and analyzing it, unpacking it, exploring it, so to speak, you're not going to get any credit for that. I don't need parrots here. This is not about rote learning. This is not about that open vessel scenario where you have a lecturer, you know, and they take this jug and here's the head of the student and they pour the stuff in. This is not that at all. This is emancipatory education where you have your own responsibility to help me facilitate the uh, release or the liberation of your intellect. That means you have to be able to analyze. You have to start asking questions. You have to look for the deeper meanings. So that's another part of that. Paying attention to detail. Oh, yeah, right, definitely. <laughs> the extent to which you pay attention to detail tells me the story of your life. It tells me whether you care about yourself, whether you take pride in your work. It tells me about your work ethic or the lack thereof. Whether you pay attention to detail tells a story in and of itself, including proper citation format. We use the Harvard system of referencing. There's one particularly used for UKZN. There are other types you know, across the world, but uh, it's got to be a proper citation format according to the Harvard system of referencing. So if I'm finding errors in that, you know, definitely I'm going to be taken off from that. Turn it in report 10% or less. You're having a session on turn it in uh, in a few days, which you'll learn more about paraphrasing and uh, how to work with the similarity index. It's not that turn it in is accusing you of, of uh, plagiarizing. Basically, what turn it in is saying is like, hey, you you cited this. About, I mean, you wrote something very similar to what this person went, and maybe you didn't give them credit. So sometimes you got to look at turning in and how it can help you and make sure that you include sources that you have forgotten, that you've omitted, because I'm sure you wouldn't intentionally just lift something from somebody else's work and put it in your document and submit it to me because, uh, you know, we do take action when that happens. Uh, and then inclusion of attachments to the final research proposal. Now, again, I won't be looking at those uh, attachments uh, prior to your submission. I'm not even going to tell you where to get them or how to formulate them. You're on your own. You're a research student. You're at a university. You should be able to uh, unpack that. All right, so uh, I think I'm just going to stop here uh, for now, and then uh, we'll pick it up shortly. Hope you're having a great time. Thank you.